I'm heading up the northeast coast of Scotland towards Peterhead, one of the biggest trawler communities in Europe. The sea is mercifully calm, but there are times when gale force winds can cause waves of 30 feet and higher. Which is why trawler fishing is considered one of the most dangerous ways to make a living. It's one of those places me against Mother Nature again. Well, fishing is definitely in the blood of the two trawler men that I'm meeting later today and the architect who risks his life to save others as a volunteer in the RNLI. And I'm stargazing at Jodrell Bank Observatory. Peterhead's association with fishing goes back many centuries. Its harbour was first built in 1593 and it remains a base for around 550 fishermen with over 90,000 tonnes of fish landed here each year. We're an island nation and a seafaring one and that's reflected in our first hymn. Who knows how many fishermen, sailors and loved ones have sung these words for comfort in the face of the dangers of the sea. Jimmy Buchan worked for 40 years in the fishing industry and with his boat, Amity 2, famously featured in the BBC series Trawler Men. It's a full force eight at the moment, probably even touching force nine. I mean, basically we shouldn't be shooting, but this is the pressure that comes onto the skipper. Watch your cellar, Kevin! Fishing has been all I've ever wanted to do from being a little boy. My grandfather was a fisherman. It missed a generation with my own dad. He was always very seasick. I just couldn't wait to leave school to go fishing. Why? What about it appealed to you? It's the hunter-gatherer. It's the sense of freedom. It's, it's chasing the bounty. Traditionally, fishermen are Christian. Why do you think that is? As harvesters of the sea, I think you're going out into a dangerous place and it's never a bad thing to have someone with you. And, and, and sometimes we think things are very, very hard and very difficult. And I always say that there is a stronger hand in this and he's guiding us all the way. There's a memorial near here to men that have lost their lives at sea. I suppose that's there as a, a constant reminder. There are fishermen who have left this port and have never come back. 
lost at sea and that is it's not easy to talk about that but it is a fact of life and it just gives you a constant reminder the dangers of fishing can still be quite catastrophic. The current skipper of the Amity 2 is Philip Reid, just back from a week-long fishing trip. So Phil, is fishing in your blood? It is, it is. I mean, my family, both sides have been fishing mm. for generations. Can you remember the first time you stepped on a trawler? How old were you? Well, I was still at school. Mm -hmm. It was my summer holidays. I think I'd been... I was 14. Yeah. It was really difficult. It was yeah. really hard. I got no sleep. <laughs> I was so tired. Um, <laughs> When we came home, I, I, was, I was never going back to sea again. Really? Well, so much for that, because now you're a skipper. <laughs> How come? It's just, it's just a way of life. There's nothing quite like it when you get a, a good catch. Mm -hmm. It's just, you're elated. It is a hard life. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll go to sea for seven or eight days, and mm -hmm. sometimes I'll take two nights ashore, but usually it's just one. Yeah. You're all Christians, right? Yep. So when you're when you're out at sea, um, are there times when you you get together as Christians as opposed to just as fellow crew members? There, there's not a lot of time for taking fellowship together, mm -hmm. but we always we always sit down in a galley and we, we always say grace before we have a meal, yeah. and that's just what we do. I see your New Testament over there. There's a lot in the Bible about fishing and fishermen. Yeah, there's the, the bit in the Bible when Jesus is fishing, mm -hmm. and they're getting it a bad catch and Jesus tells them to cast our nets over the starboard side so as a tradition we always take our catch on board on the starboard side Wow, that's why you do it That's why we do it How important is your faith to you? Speaking about your faith can be difficult sometimes Yeah It's something that you have within yourself and it's it's very personal uh, The Lord's with me every day throughout every aspect of my day to day life. Sitting in a beautiful spot like this, you really are confronted with the wonder of God's creation. And then when you factor in the stars and the planets and the universe, it's truly mind-boggling and humbling. Well, the hugely popular series Stargazing Live has been back on our screens. So we send our own Reverend Kate Botley to explore infinity and beyond at Jodrell Bank Observatory. 2017 marks the 60th anniversary of the Lovell Telescope. It's one of the biggest radio telescopes in the whole world. And since the summer of 1957 has been silently probing the depths of space. 
It's a real symbol of our desire to understand the universe in which we live. But the more we discover about the cosmos, create greater tension between faith and science. One woman who has an interest in both is astrophysicist and Christian, Dr. Althea Wilkinson. Tell me, what made you want to be an astrophysicist? Well, I think I wanted to um, understand the answers to, you know, the big questions of life. You know, why is there anything at all? What, how did the universe start? And all this sort of thing. So uh, I got into physics and then into astrophysics uh, with that aim in mind. And forgive me, explain to me, what is it you do? We mostly get observations from big telescopes, like this one, but also optical telescopes. And we analyse and understand and interpret the data to tell us what's up there. And this big telescope is gathering data right now? It is. It's looking at a pulsar right at this minute. It's a rotating neutron star, which is flashing. And we're just seeing the flash each time it comes round. Sounds like the disco ball of the universe. Like a lighthouse of the universe, Amazing. yes. Amazing. <laughs> And you're a person of faith as well, yes. as science. Do you think there's a conflict between faith and science? No, I don't. No, I don't at all think there is. In fact, I think they're, in a way, different aspects of the same thing. You know, I think you've got the scientific knowledge of mankind and you've got the faith knowledge of mankind, but it's all a small subset of the overall knowledge of God. And your journey to faith, was that an easy one? No, it was a huge surprise actually. I went to a course on studying the Bible and I was telling a friend at the end of the course, you know, I, I can't do this faith thing. And she said to me, well, it's not something you do, it's something God does for you. And I quite literally felt as if I'd been tapped on the shoulder and somebody said, you've not been paying attention, I've been here all the time. And so I decided that, you know, if that was true, that was the most important thing I'd ever heard. And I decided to suspend disbelief and investigate further. And I'm still investigating. <laughs> like a proper scientist should, <laughs> weighing up all the evidence. Yeah, love it. And there's still lots more to find out about the universe. Oh my goodness, we're just <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> yes. And do you think as we find out more and more about the cosmos, do you think that faith will be lost if we discover more of the facts about our world? Well, you see, I don't think it needs to be because any increase in our knowledge actually just takes us a little further in understanding the whole totality of what God has done. Sweet is the work, my God and King, to praise your name, give thanks and sing, to tell your love by morning light, your faithfulness all through the night. 